Thank you. Please be seated. I'm delighted to be with you again this evening. If you have your Bibles with you, would you open to 1 Corinthians 9, starting at verse 19. And as Paul the Apostle speaking to us, down through the pages of biblical history, and he says these words, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself servant to all that I might win the more. And so to the Jews I became as a Jew that I might win Jews, to those who are under the law as under the law that I might win those who are under the law, to those who are without law as without law, not being without law towards God but under law towards Christ, that I might win those who are without law. Or to the weak I became as weak that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now this I do for the gospel's sake, that I may be partaker of it with you. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore, I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and I bring it into subjection, lest, when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Tonight we're going to talk about entrepreneurship from a biblical perspective. And have you any idea what it would be like for one of the prophets of old to come and live here in the 21st century and carry out God's word in a modern situation. I'm referring to Noah and God asked Noah to build an ark and he said he was going to destroy all flesh and flood the earth. In fear and trembling, Noah takes the plans and agrees to build the ark. There's a time specification for it to be done. And when the time comes for completion, the storms appear, the seas start to rise. God looks down from heaven to Noah and says, Noah, where's the ark? He says, Lord, please forgive me. I did my best, but there were some big problems. First, I had to get a permit for construction. Your plans did not comply with the codes. <laughs> I had to hire an engineering firm to redraw the plans, and then I got into a fight with the Occupation Health and Safety Commission <laughs> over whether or not the ark needed a fire sprinkler system or a flotation device. I got that cleared up and then my neighbour objected, claiming I was violating zoning ordinances by building the ark in my front yard. <laughs> so I had to lodge a rezoning application with the city council and it's now with the land and environmental court. I had problems getting enough wood for the ark because there's a ban on cutting down trees to protect the birds. I finally convinced the Department of Conservation and Land Management that the reason I needed the wood was to save the birds. <laughs> However, the National Parks and Wildlife won't let me catch any birds, so no birds. <laughs> then the carpenters formed a union and went out on strike. I had to negotiate a settlement with the Department of Industrial Relations before anyone would pick up a saw or a hammer. And I now have 16 carpenters on the ark, but still no birds. 
When I started rounding up the other animals, I got sued by the Royal Society for the Protection to Cruelty to Animals. <laughs> they objected to the confined conditions on the Ark and reminded me that in Section 4, Subsection 2 of the Act, under which the license to keep native animals was granted, it stipulates a minimum space requirement. <laughs> and then just when I got that suit dismissed, the Environmental Protection Association notified me that I could not complete the ARC without filing an environmental impact statement on your proposed flood. They didn't take very kindly to the idea that they had no jurisdiction over the conduct of the creator of the universe. <laughs> then the Department of Land and Water Conservation demanded a map of the proposed new floodplain. Right now, I'm trying to resolve a complaint filed by the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. They claim that I'm practicing discrimination by not taking godless, unbelieving people aboard. I got that settled, and then the tax office has taken my possessions and my passport, claiming that I'm building the ark in preparation to leave the country to avoid paying my taxes. <laughs> I'm also told I have to wait for the registration of my business number and the goods and services tax before proceeding any further. Today I received a notice from the Waterways Authority stating I owe them some kind of user tax and failed to register the ark as a recreational watercraft. <laughs> I also needed a boat driver's license but they're still debating about how to classify the craft. I'm getting continual visits from Greenpeace, the Royal Society for the Protection of Cruelty to Animals, Work Cover, the Sheriff's Office and numerous other government departments that I didn't even know existed. Finally, the Council for Civil Liberties convinced the court to in issue an injunction against further construction of the Ark, saying since it's God is flooding the earth, it is a religious event and therefore unconstitutional. <laughs> Lord, I really don't think I can finish the ark for a long, long time. <laughs> the skies began to clear. The seas settled down. And God looked up to heaven when he saw a rainbow come across the sky. And Noah said to him, Lord, aren't you going to destroy the earth after all? He said, no. He said, I don't have to. Your bureaucracies have already done it. <laughs> Now, if I haven't got your attention, let's see if we can get it on the board. When you get home tonight, I want you to add up all of your assets. Ladies, your earrings. Gentlemen, your power tools. Your motor cars, your motorbikes, your furniture, your cutlery, your linen, your house, your trailer. Everything that you own for once in your lifetime, do an evaluation of what you own. If you do not know the price of it, add it up. Guess it. And when you've come to a conclusion, do this once in your lifetime. When you've come to a conclusion, then take off 20%. Why? Because you'll lie to yourself. Christians always think evangelistically. When you've taken off the 20%, then take off everything you owe. Your credit cards, your mortgage, whatever you owe. Then I want you to write this down something like this. I want you to do some simple mathematics. Whatever that figure is, I want you to write it here and that's your net value as a family or as a human being. When you've assessed your net value, I want you to divide by the years you have worked. It may be 10 years, it may be 30 years, it may be 
40 years, it may be 18 years. So you divide, if you've worked for 18 years, you divide your net value by 18. And the answer you get here, whatever that is, is what you've sold your life for per annum in the greatest economy in the history of the human race. And ask yourself the question, if you go to meet the Savior tonight and you walk through the portals of heaven and God says to you, Peter, what did you do down there? I could have put you in Kosovo. I could have put you in the dark ages. I could have put you any time in history. But I put you in one of the greatest economies in the history of humanity that you might invest into the gospel, that you might go into business, that you might do something spectacular for me. What did you do? And I will show him this, and I will be ashamed. Now we need to get our act together as Christians. We need to take back the economics. I'm tired of Christians being broke. I'm tired of people growing old and eking out a meager living instead of living properly and leaving a heritage to their children's children. Biblical economics is very simple. If your grandfather had left a heritage to you and his grandfather left a heritage to him and his grandfather left a heritage to him and his grandfather left a heritage to him and so on you would own half of this city today that's God's economics and many of you are not following it there's something else I'd like you to get involved with it's called the good policy get out of debt and stay out of debt I know that some of you are saying you don't understand I do understand. I was hopelessly in debt. I had so many unsatisfied judgments, summonses, I could have papered walls in the house. And you do it this way. You do it either by earning more or spending less. I like the first one. I like to suffer at a very high level. <laughs> or you can start with the smallest amount and pay that off and compound onto the next, onto the next, on to the next and on to the next. Now tonight is going to be on entrepreneurship. We will have some questions at the end and you can ask any question you like. You cannot embarrass me, you won't upset me, but make sure you understand Shakespeare in Othello where it says, oh God, that man should use his mouth as an enemy to his brain. <laughs> Tomorrow night, we will have four chairs out here. I will have this board done quite differently. And we will need two men and two women over the age of 18. We're not allowed to use any of the leaders here. I don't want any of the leaders to be involved. I don't want anyone that's got or getting destiny of the third millennium. I don't want them to be involved. They will not need that. And the four people that come up here will never be the same again. I guarantee it. I've done it in South Africa. I've done it all over South Africa. I've done it all over the world. Nearly 1,000 times. Now these four people have come up. They may be better when they get down. They may be worse. But I can guarantee you they'll never be the same. <laughs> now business people. Entrepreneurs are the strong beacon of all commercial life. They search out beneficial change, illuminate and grasp opportunity and dare to explore the edge of safe limits and in doing so create new frontiers and push on further to remove the dim veil of ignorance, timidity and all that is yet to be seen, experienced and discovered. Without them the path of progress would be a stagnant residue of forgotten and discarded dreams. These are the economic giants of the world who sometimes unseen affect the lives of us all because without them countries and their inhabitants would continue to wallow and at times perish while they stand subdued at the doorway of opportunity and prosperity bound by their own fears, uncertainty and indecision. 
These giants lead the parade of progress, uninhibited by chains that bind ordinary men, and they are for the most time misunderstood, envied, and at times criticized by the very people they seek to provide benefit. These extraordinary heroes of the human race disturb the gratitude of mankind and we would all do well to examine the tenure of their spirit and where applicable learn from them. I've said several times I'm a student of history and as I studied the 21st century and now looking back on the 20th century and before, the greatest power force was the Christian Church, who have more people with agreement on vital issues, more real estate, more money, more gold, more silver, more literature, more compassion, but without any real cohesion or unity. If you doubt for one moment what I've just said in the area of economics, then multiply all the treasures of the Vatican, the Episcopal Church, and all the other real estate owned by the hundreds of thousands of churches and missions, and add that to the personal possessions of Christians throughout the world, and you will find it is the greatest and most amazing gathering of economic people power in the history of the human race. Unfortunately, the power that we possess is useless, it's dormant, and it's ineffective. And it will stay that way unless one special nation or one special group of people decide under the providence of God that we will go back to our biblical roots and challenge the world into the 21st century with a dynamic plan that honors and glorifies God. Those of us who claim to be the protectors of our faith and seek to preserve deep in our souls the title deeds of the incorruptible word of God need to arrest ourselves and observe with candor and clarity without glossing over the facts that we who represent the gospel are on the verge of losing the battle for the souls of men. Why? Because we ignore the strength, perception, plans and flagrant boldness of those who challenge biblical inerrancy and authority. And yet we continue on with the frothing of words which provide a cozy closet of make-believe without measurements, agitation or pressure so we can become theological philosophers from a background of nothingness. We are the soldiers of the faith. But we continue to live in a void. And if we do not rise to the great challenge afforded to us by Scripture, then we will have to sneak away like condemned traitors towards a forgotten faith, ignoring our better self, while we continue to live a lie undisturbed by hope, wallowing in the stagnant waters of denial, only to hear the words of old ringing with all of its penalty and conviction in our ears, you have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. That's why we, as Bible-believing Christians, must relive and reclaim our ancient mandate of occupy until I come. And then, and only then, the tenure of our faith that has been trusted to us demands us to be resolute in our cause, be gallant and fearless in the discharge of our duty. I believe that Christians need to go into business. And the first reason that you need to go into business is that it creates a special kind of freedom. And this freedom allows you to pursue a cause of endeavor that will, under God, direct your future. It well may be that the business itself will not fulfill your dreams, but it could, if carefully and diligently pursued, provide the financial resources to do so. The second reason you need to go into business is that you'll become a participant rather than a spectator and you'll be able to set standards for economics and morality. We don't know what your ethics are. We don't know what your morality is until you've got your back to the wall in a business deal where clock is ticking. 
and the money is going down the drain. Thirdly, by owning your own business, you cannot be fired or made redundant. The fourth reason is that you can spend special time with your family and give them a good lifestyle. You have been sold a lie. You do not have to work 18 hours a day. You do not have to work seven days a week. My wife and I pick our grandchildren up from school, take them to McDonald's and Toys R Us. Uh, I don't even get up early. I think if God wanted me to see the sunrise, he'd schedule it later in the day. I'll watch it on video. <laughs> I, think more, I, think, I think mornings are overrated. Some of you people are having a quiet time at 5 and 6 o'clock in the morning. I talk to God at 10 o'clock. He's not busy then. <laughs> the fifth reason why you should go into business, it is a strong message to the community that your faith is more than words and that you have removed yourself from the timber waters of mediocrity. The sixth reason you need to go into business is you are following the biblical mandate of being light to the world. You are now a leader, not a maintenance seeker or manager. The seventh reason you need to go into business, it is an indication of your sense of responsibility as you become a benefit to the community and the country that you live in. The eighth reason is as an advantage that you will develop and obtain influence over people and events and you will be able to invest in your local church and help others. Nine, being a successful business person, you'll be able to build a heritage for the future generations of your family, invoking the biblical mandate that a good man leaves a heritage to his children's children. And finally, number 10, your own fulfillment as a provider and a leader within your own household will ensure respect, responsibility and repetition because your children and your children's children will look at what you've done and copy it. Now being a Christian entrepreneur implies and presupposes that being a Christian indicates boundaries, limitations, discipline that may not be observed in normal business behavior. For instance, I believe as a Christian that a verbal agreement is just as binding and valid as a legal document. And involvement in some areas of business activities should be excluded from the Christian entrepreneur. Why? Because our value system is different, which does not suggest our lack of interest in making a profit, but rather the means by which a profit is made. And then further, biblical obligation to how such profits are used or distributed. Responsibilities to employees has an additional challenge in the way they are paid and treated with an awareness that we are continually under the spotlight in respect to our public and private behavior. Examples must be set. Boundaries have to be observed. Principles need to be maintained. Quality and quantity, costs, marketing positions, services will need to be your continued daily companion to enable you to remain solvent. Unsatisfactory staff have to be promptly and carefully removed. Measurements and deadlines are crucial. All standards must be set. Should we fall into the trap of retaining unsuitable employees for whatever reason, we destroy staff morale, limit or modify our effectiveness, which in turn will eventually cause a loss and finally everyone loses their job. Now I'm going to talk about how to be a Christian entrepreneur and it depends upon three very simple factors. First of all, the climate of the times in which we live. We live in probably one of the most exciting times in the history of the world. The Berlin Wall has gone. Communism is finished. We've had enormous world wars. Hopefully they're behind us. We have a look and we see what's happening in Europe with the European Union, which will be the greatest marketing force we believe in this century. We take note of what is happening in the Middle East, who are abundant in oil but uh, lack some kind of ethics in the way that they behave. We have a look at the British Empire that at one time the sun never set. It is now a derelict empire. 
we have a look at what is happening here in the United States and we understand that you owe six trillion dollars. I made a comment last night and my wife said that I made the comment incorrectly. Six trillion dollars means this, that if someone lost a million dollars every day since the day that Jesus was born, they would be in better shape than the United States. It also means this, that if you could stop borrowing today, that would be a great miracle in America. But if you could start paying it back, it would be a bigger miracle. And if you could pay it back at a dollar a second, and you started 150 years ago, you have to go 159,000 years to pay your bills. You are terrifying the life out of the whole Western world because we don't want anyone else to be the leader. We don't want anyone else to be the superpower. But you see, Christians must lead. That's what the Bible says. We, not them, are the light of the world. We are God's rescue squad. And if you won't go into business, if you won't form corporation, if you don't do anything, then there's no hope for the rest of the world because God does not have any other plans. We are the people that have to get the job done. I, uh, I know as a fact, as I speak with the United Nations and the World Bank and others, that they're not going to let you into the European Union. They're going to allow, do everything they can to keep you out of that market. And Japan and China are going to keep you out of Asia with the possible exception of the Philippines. Well, where are you going to go for your markets? I have been speaking to some of your members of Congress and others in government for about 20 years now telling them why don't they start at Alaska and go right down to Chile. You've got 300 million people down there who you could lift the standard of living, who will work. You've got arable land. You've got all the minerals that you require. You wouldn't violate any sea lanes or, or any airspace. You could build a missile base from Chile right up to Alaska and you could keep the world free for 500 years. We have a look at what is happening in Africa. Uh, Africa, unfortunately, unless something dramatic happens, we have to forget about Africa for the next 100 years. Why? Because for 200 years we've poured resources into Africa, this great continent, these magnificent specimens of humanity. We've poured finance in there and missionaries for 200 years. It has neither changed their culture, their religion, their economics or their ethics. We must stop doing what we're failing in and have another look at what we're doing there. We have a look at, uh, at Japan today after Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Many of you won't remember that, but people my age remember that, the first atomic bomb that wiped them out and they rose from the ashes. But you can't look at Japan anymore without looking at uh, China. Because today, Japan and China are talking the first time since 1936 when Japan uh, did the rape of Nanking and 1933 when they, uh, they conquered Manchuria. They're talking today. Why? Because Japan's roots are in China, their music is in China, their architecture is in China. What would happen if these two great nations came together? What would happen if China opened up the doors to Japan and they went in and drilled for bauxite and oil and gold and silver and diamonds and iron ore and uranium? Uh, what would happen if they took in one million Mitsubishi tractors to till the land? What would happen if they used the 1.2 billion people to manufacture labor-intensive goods? How would you sell anything? What would happen if they joined together and formed a coalition that would be the greatest superpower the world has ever known? And you sit back and you scratch your blessed assurance. <laughs> well, that's not going to do it. And you're not going to do it on your knees. There comes a time when you have to get up off your knees and go out into the world. David did not kill Goliath on his knees. We, and Nehemiah did not build the wall on his knees. He prayed to his God and then he went out and he built the wall. We can't, uh, we can't look at any of those countries and, uh, and say any of them were the super success without looking at South Korea. South Korea in 1956 was the poorest nation on the face of the earth. Poor even in India in real terms because they needed fuel to keep warm. South Korea is the greatest economic success 
of the 20th century, the climate of the times in which we live. This is the most exciting time in history. The Asiatic word for crisis is a double-sided word. It's danger and opportunity. And we have the greatest opportunity that we've ever had before. You see, as a Bible-believing Christian, you can go to Moscow, you can go to Calcutta, you can go to Sydney, you can go to Hong Kong, you can go to Beijing, you can go anywhere in the world and you'll be accepted immediately by Christians. You can't do that with any other organization. You, it's just not possible. I come here and as soon as I come and they know I'm Christians, I'm accepted by Christians because we have a common code. We have a Bible that we believe in and, and I mean, the climate of the times in which we live, the greatest time in history. Secondly, what you personally are prepared to do as a service to others. I've heard the lament. 46 years as a Christian, I've heard, well, I want to be a servant leader. Good. Build a corporation and give people a job. You see, that's being a servant leader. But uh, it's not groveling in the dust. It's not working for a pittance. It's not uh, 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 being a slave to, to, uh, to bosses. What you personally are prepared to do is a service to others. And thirdly, what you personally are willing to sacrifice along the way. This may take some thinking power. I think Albert Schweitzer, before he died, they said to him, what's wrong with modern man? He said he simply will not think. And the Bible tells us, don't conform. Transform by using your brain. And let me tell you, you don't have to lose your family. That's a lie of the devil. Our family is so close, we live in one another's refrigerators. We've, my second son, who manages our companies worldwide, we've never even raised our voice to one another. Never had an argument. Why? Because the relationship is more important than anything else. Two out of those three statements depend upon you. Success is not a demand on life, it is a vigorous response to life. And entrepreneurs, business people are the lifeblood of a country. And it's through entrepreneurship, not government, that growth and enterprise flourish. If you are a success, then this nation succeeds. And if the entrepreneurial spirit falters or is stifled, then that which makes any nation great is nullified and void. But because of the speed of travel, the explosion of information, and the instancy of communication, isolation for the United States of America is no longer possible. You're going to have to shed your adolescence and assume the role of adulthood and face the future in the 21st century as economically rich world standards, not only because of your resources in primary production of minerals, but also because of your often forgotten human potential that if stimulated could rewrite the economic history books here in the West and towards the third world nations. I was watching CNN before I came here tonight and listening to some of the uh, some of the economic entertainers and uh, I think it was uh, I think it was George Bernard Shaw that said you'd get a hundred economists and lay them head to toe on the ground they wouldn't even reach a conclusion <clears throat> but the mainstream economists for the first time in history have come together and they say there are five essentials necessary for a nation to succeed as we thunder along in this the 21st century the first is a rich, modern, highly productive agricultural base. The second is a rich base of energy-bearing materials. The third is an abundant supply of non-energy-bearing materials. The fourth is a highly developed technology. And the fifth is a highly educated and sophisticated population. And of all the nations of the world, and all the emerging nations of the world, there are only three nations on the, uh, on the planet that have all of these five requirements in their country. One is Australia, the second is Canada, and the third one you've guessed it is the United States of America. You see with the limitation of other countries and the enormity of the opportunity before you this evening, the position here must inflict upon you commitment. The position you're in in the work economic world scene must compel you to be responsible and to strive for excellence. Your opportunity for success has never been greater. The timetable has never been more accurate. The rewards have never been so large and reachable. Opportunity is not knocking at the door, it's literally tearing the door down. And the key to realizing the potential of your opportunity is to make a commitment 
And that commitment must be fastened to a belief in what you're doing and a firm, clear plan for growth. You see, ladies and gentlemen, we have been through the industrial age, the automotive age, the jet age, the space age, the electronic age, and many believe today that we're in the age of the cortex. Many believe that the human mind is on the periphery of its greatness. It is the last great unconquered area of mankind. And now is the time to cut the fetters from our mind and allow it to soar as it was divinely designed to do so. But we're moving very quickly towards that global village. The military components, the monetary system, life expectation, geography, even our markets are different. We understand that the bulk knowledge of the world is doubling every 10 years and if you're not twice as smart as you were 10 years ago, you're going backwards. The great economist Frank Goebel said many years ago, the mind's ability to tune or filter information in or out is very similar to the function of a radio. He said the radio antennae is receiving messages from many different stations, but the operator elim eliminates all but one station at a time by means of a tuning device. What is he talking about here? He's talking about focusing. E.F. Shoemaker, the great economist, says economics does not start with goods. It starts with people, their education, organization, and discipline. And without these three, all resources remain latent, untapped potential, like the marvelous unlimited resources of Brazil. As we gather here tonight, I believe we must stimulate ourselves to contemplate and examine the results of the past and look circumspectly at the present and with our dreams and aspirations girded with reality, brace our spirits and hopes towards an exciting future. We need to come to grips with individual responsibility once again. If my Bible teaches anything, and it teaches a great deal, it teaches personal accountability. But there's something happening through our churches throughout the entire world. We got people in our churches that, uh, that say, well, you don't understand, uh, I've been rejected. Well, I rejected every woman in the world when I married my wife. There's a lot of rejected people around. <laughs> I mean, when are we going to grow up? I've been rejected, so you have to carry me. You don't know how I've been brought up. Well, I wasn't brought up, I was dragged up. Well, I've been very ill, you know. You have to look after me. I've got the biggest aneurysm in Australia's history in my brain. I've got scars across my heart. Uh, I mean... I'm a walking time bomb. It's called personal accountability. And we, we got people in our churches that want a free ride and they, they, they try to tell us, you know, all the problems they've got and that's why they have to have a free ride. Dr. Alfred Adler, the great Austrian psychiatrist, understood this and he spoke of what he called the life, life, the neurotic. I'm going to reach in very deep here. It is a categorical demand of the patient's life plan that he or she should fail through the guilt of others and thus be free from any responsibility. If I can blame the system, if I can blame the way you've treated me or the way somebody's spoken to me or something, then uh, you have to carry me. I know some people need psychiatric help and psychologists can help them if they start in the beginning. God... But the English psychologist, Dr. Hanjay Einzak, analyzed 19 reports covering 7,000 psychiatric cases, and he found the rate of cure or improvement with psychiatric help. Now, remember this figure. With psychiatric help, the improvement was at 64%. He compared that to a spontaneous recovery rate. That is a rate of recovery for individuals who receive no therapy at all, and that was 66%. Seems to me some of our psychiatrists might be driving us crazy. <laughs> the Canadian psychiatrist, Dr. Raymond Price, spent 17 months studying Nigerian witch doctors, and his conclusion was that their therapeutic results were about equal to those obtained in the North American clinics and hospitals. And for those of you who feel as though you're too old, God bless you. Too young, also have some mental or physical handicaps that prevent you from success. Listen, I'm colorblind. I cannot tell a color. I was married to my wife 20 years before I found out she wasn't black. <laughs> I, c 
cannot tell a colour. I sold more paint in Australia than any other human being. Now let me hate to remind you that at 100 years of age, Grandma Moses was painting masterpieces. That a 94 Bertram Russell was active in national peace drives. That a 92 Rubenstein gave one of his greatest recitals in New York's Carnegie Hall. That at 89 Albert Schweitzer was head of hospitals in Africa. That at 88 Conrad Adenauer was Chancellor of Germany. That at 82 Sir Winston Churchill wrote the history of the English speaking people. That at 46 Ludwig van Beethoven became totally deaf but he wrote his greatest music during those latter years. In Orange County in California there's a man called Henry Viscount. Junior. He was born without legs. He is the president of the Human Resource Center and founder of Abilities Incorporated with 13 honorary degrees and nine books to his credit. So the question I have to ask you is, what's your problem? <laughs> Are you an excusiologist? William James was probably the greatest behavioral scientist of the 20th century and he said the greatest discovery of my generation is you can change your life by changing your attitude. The Bible says it better. It says you can be born again. You can go in an entirely different direction. God won't even hold account of what has happened in the past. You can't get a better deal than that. Edison said greatness is an ordinary man or woman with an extraordinary attitude. Well, I believe now is the time for reason to reclaim its rights. For too long, you have accepted your lot in life as a kind of obedient drudgery. For too long, you've listened to the theorists who walk you through the fog of doubt. For too long, you've met at the table of maintenance seekers and sat hungry at their table. For too long, you've sought direction from boneless wonders who wear masks of piety and feign deep beliefs, and yet they keep your souls unsatisfied. It's time. It's time for you to take back ec economics and own major corporations instead of being employment fodder, suffocating in the amorphous glob of sameness. And the first law of success is mastery over procrastination. Do it now. Mastery over procrastination. Now, my wife and I don't agree on everything. I said, I don't know why we still argue. I'm right 98% of the time for the 2%. It's just not worth it. I'm going to tell you what she said back. <laughs> but we don't agree on everything. And, uh, I mean, lots of things that I do, uh, she just doesn't agree with me. But, you know, many years ago, a long time ago, I had to go to Perth, Western Australia. Now, all of you ought to know where Perth, Western Australia is. That's where they took the America's Cup from you. <laughs> you didn't know you had it until we took it. <laughs> but it was in Western Australia. People say to me, do you take your wife everywhere with you? It was cheaper than alimony. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get married to be separated. I mean, she's my security blanket. And if I am chairman of the board of directors and I've got males in the board of directors, I fly their wives in too. That way they don't drink and mess around. <laughs> and I bring the women into the boardroom and I ask them to comment and ask questions. That way I get their brains for nothing. <laughs> I'm not stupid. <laughs> but we were in Perth, Western Australia, and I had to speak to a men's group. And they were calling for me at the hotel at 9 o'clock. I said to my wife, I said, sweetheart, I'll be back at 5 o'clock. By the way, uh, now you can't come as a men's group. But what, what, what are you going to do today? She said, I'm going shopping. Oh, my goodness. Now, this is many years ago. We we're well up, but not as well up as we are today. I said, what, what, what are you going shopping for? She said, I'm going to buy a dress. And what do you need a dress for? You've got plenty of dresses. She said, Peter, have you forgotten our eldest son is getting married? I need a special dress for the wedding. I said, one dress? She said, one dress. We even kissed on it. <laughs> <clears throat> I went out and spoke at these functions and spent all day with these men and I came back at the hotel at five o'clock at night and I knocked on the door of our hotel room. She opened the door with flourish. 
I smelled a rat immediately. <laughs> She's a little more amorous than normal. As I held her, I looked over her shoulder and saw two boxes on the bed. I said, I thought we had a deal here. She said, now hang on. There's an interesting story about this. Always an interesting story. <clears throat> she said, you, you left in the morning at nine o'clock. I went down to Hay Street in Perth. I saw a, sh in a, a shop window a dress that looked perfect for Peter Jr.'s wedding. I went in, I tried it on. There was a sign that said, no credits and no returns. There it is. I said, what about the other one? She said, don't rush me. I'm coming to that. She said, I got back to the hotel, put it there, and it's only 10.30 in the morning. What am I supposed to do while you're throwing yourself off the platform all over the city? She said, so I caught a bus and went to Fremantle to have a look at some of the old buildings that early convicts built. She said, and suddenly I found myself in the shopping center. <laughs> she said, it was a beautiful mall. She said, and I walked up and down there and I had a lovely time. I had some morning tea. She said, and there's pipe music coming through the amplification system. She said, and I was having a lovely time. She said, and it was wonderful. I was all on my own. She said, and, uh, but suddenly I was arrested by another dress shop. <laughs> she said, when I looked in the window, it was better than the other one. And I knew I couldn't take it back and I knew that we'd made an agreement. She said, but I stood there looking at it and I hear the music through the amplification system. She said, and suddenly I thought, I heard your voice. <laughs> I said, what did it say? She said, mastery over procrastination. Do it now. And I did. <laughs> but it's the single most important tool for success. There are people here in this church tonight that have been procrastinating for decades. And you know who you are. And there are people here that have been procrastinating for years, and some of you for months. You're scared. You're terrified to make that move. You want it. don't want to get away from that security. Maybe you ought to come if they let you. I don't know whether they do let you come tomorrow when I'm talking about what do you do when your dreams start to fade at 11 o'clock, but I know what happens there. But, but mastery over procrastination. As I go to my office of a morning, when I go, I don't go very often. I mean, there's a whole bad deal put about running your own business, you know. They think you've got to work, you know, 18 hours a day, seven days a week. I don't know what's happening to people. I mean, I, I certainly don't do that. In the early days, I did when I was stupid. But, but I got smart, and uh, I don't do that anymore. And I haven't been doing that for a long, long time. A long, long time. But uh, now I've lost my point, see? How about that? Uh, but uh, as I go to work, if I go to work in the morning, when I go, the once that I do, two hours a week, that's what I put in. I go to the office. And you'll hear me, you'll hear me say, as I'm driving, do it now, 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 and build up the affirmation. Mastery over procrastination. Do it now. Principle number two, enthusiasm. Uh, in my international headquarters, I had these words. Either get enthusiastic within 10 seconds or get out. The word enthusiasm comes from two Greek words, entheo, meaning the God within. Enthusiasm is the outflowing of pleasing personality and a contagious enjoyment for what you're doing. Enthusiasm is not void of reason, it's clarity of plans and energy with wings. The third principle of success is to develop habit force. Mankind are creatures of habit. You can change your life by changing your habit. Your inner feelings are reflected to your outer action. Some of you uh, have bad habits or good habits that have been handed down from generation to generation. And you never look at them, you never measure them, you never investigate whether it's good or bad. Now let me give you another little situation at home. Many years ago, we lived about three quarters of an hour drive from the office. I came home one rainy day and Rabina was out. I went in the house, I took my coat off, my jacket off, my waistcoat, my tie off, I took my briefcase out, spread some paper around, made a pot of tea, and I was going to do a little bit of work, and suddenly I looked around and it looked like a nuclear fallout center. And I realized at that point that I was a slob. 
I reflected on the way I'd been living for the last 20 years, and you just about had to have a permanent pickup service after me. I made a decision that I was going to change my habits. I heard Rabina's motor car coming up the drive, so I put a chair opposite me when I told her I was going to sit her down. I didn't want to go into cardiac arrest. <laughs> she came in. I said, I've got an announcement to make. She said, this will be good. I said, you better sit down. She said, that bad, eh? I said, you have been conducting a 20-year free pickup service for me. She said, that's the truth. I said, well, as long as, as long as I live, you'll never, ever, ever have to pick up after me again. Well, she almost went into seizure. <laughs> but fellas, I want to tell you something. You can change any habit. And after about three days, everything worked well. For about three days. <laughs> and suddenly I was going in my office one day, several days later, and I remember to left my pajamas on the floor in the bathroom. How do you handle that? Well, we didn't have cell phones those days. I took my hand off the office door. Chaos would have happened in my office. I drove three quarters of an hour home. When I walked in, Rabina said, what are you doing home? I said, well, I left my pajamas on the floor in the bathroom. She said, oh, come on, Peter. She said, come on, you, you just had to phone me. I would have fixed that. I said, yes, but it would have destroyed my personal accountability. You can change your life by changing your habits, but if you're going to change your habit for the first 100 days, you must never, ever, ever, ever let an exception occur, and that habit will lock in, and it'll be hard to break. You may have it for a lifetime. So why not consciously create new habits, good habits, productive habits, and never let an exception occur? Principle number four develop a positive mental attitude. The Bible says whatever things are good report, think on these things. The creator of the Instamatic camera said, whenever I get a good idea, I incubate myself from negative thinking people. I only need one negative comment to destroy a good idea. You see, a positive mental attitude means spending your creative energy, energies on finding ways things can be done rather than exhausting your emotional and mental powers dwelling on the way things cannot be done. It means turning a problem into a solution. It means you must develop thought displacement and sand sentinel at the gate of your mind and challenge thoughts as they come in. Principle number five, pay the full price. So many people good people, Bible-believing Christians, start out on the road to success and pay a down payment by way of a verbal commitment, and then they default in their periodical and final payments. I was on television some years ago, and they were flying in a guru, an atheist, who supposedly was going to tear me to shreds. When the makeup was on and we were walking into the studio, the crowd was clapping and the studio manager took me by the arm and he said, Mr. Daniels, there's a step, the lights are going to be bright, I don't want you to fall. I'll hold your arm as you take that first step. They're announcing you now, you'll have to go in. By the way, there's a change. I said, what is the change? They said, well, they don't have one person debating with you now, they have four. Well, immediately I knew they were in trouble. <laughs> and the first question they asked me, Mr. Daniels, is it true that you only uh, have one pair of shoes? I said, yes, that's right. They said, with all the millions you've made, why do you only have one pair of shoes? I said, that, 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 that's quite obvious. I only got one pair of feet. They <laughs> said, would you drive a Rolls Royce? I said, yes, but I've only got one of them. Uh, they said, could you give us a definition for success? I said, yes, the willingness to bear pain. I didn't say be a pain. I said, a bear pain, but you've got, to, you've got to get out of the comfort zone. You've got to move into the pain arena. Well, it wasn't a very difficult debate. I don't think that studied Shakespeare and Othello either, you know, where it says that, you know, why should man use his mouth as an enemy to his brain? They expect some milk toast Christians, you know, I tear them apart. Uh, <clears throat>
But success is a price, a payment, the exchange of sacrificial commitment and personal discipline in mental, spiritual, physical and time output. And yet so many honest and dedicated people with character and intelligence would never lie on a commitment to anyone else but continually, persistently, habitually adopt what we call a pseudo-rationalization to themselves and break commitments by way of pseudo-rationale, thereby pushing themselves lower in their own esteem and at the same time they're within the subconscious mind, strengthening the chains that already bind. I mean, we have these Christians that say, well, I'm waiting on God. Hey, he's in front. He's waiting for us. I mean, some of these cliches we have, well, God has closed the door. Kick it down. <laughs> There's nothing capricious in God's nature. He will not give you a dream without giving you the ability to fulfill that dream. Paying the full price means a commitment to excellence and learning how to excel in dimensions that we have never known before in our lives. What God has given you to do, you must know your stuff inside and out, saturate yourself with it. There is nothing that will put a spring of confidence in your walk and in your performance like being sure that you definitely, concretely and specifically know what you're doing. Number six, learn to speak on your feet. Now, I say this because you may build a large corporation. Even if you've only got a corporation of 50 people, sooner or later you're going to have to address them and you're going to have to convince them of something. You may have to do a press conference. You might have to do a television interview. Don't wait for it to happen. Prepare. Abraham Lincoln said, I will study, I will prepare, and my opportunity will come. When I came to Christ, I knew that I'd had to prepare. And for five years, almost daily, I practiced articulation. I would listen to the British broadcasting radio programs. I would practice, 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 practice for five years. Of course, nobody ever asked me to speak. But then when it did happen, I was the best equipped guy in town. And suddenly it exploded. I was getting these invitations from everywhere, but I had a major, major, major problem. I, I, I was nervous. I was very nervous. If I had to speak to you years ago, I'd have woken up at 2 o'clock this morning with nerves. I mean, I couldn't even hang on to this thing. It would shake all over the place. I'm serious. It was really bad. Uh, because, uh, you know, I was uneducated. I, I you know, I, I didn't want to make a fool of myself and I, I didn't want to bring God's name into disrepute and, and so I, I overcompensated. I, I studied so hard. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I'd, I'd run a mile at 2 o'clock in the morning, at 3 o'clock, at 4 o'clock, at 5 o'clock, at 6 o'clock, at 7 o'clock. Then I'd run back with them forward to the bathroom all day. Now, I don't have to paint any pictures. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Half hour before I'd leave to go and speak, my, I'd say, come on, sweetheart, get it. She said, I'm not going to do it. I said, sweetheart, don't give me a hard time. Just get it, please. She said, this is not right what you're doing. Sweetheart, just get it. Please help me. So she'd get a large glass, half fill it with milk. She'd put in three tablespoons of burnt flour, three spoons of sugar, and mix up a glue. And she'd stir that glue, that thick glue. And I would <coughs> gug that down, and that would buy my bowels so I wouldn't have an accident when I stood up. I did that for 15 years, 15 years, and when I got home I'd take four laxettes to get it all back to normal again. <laughs> I did it for 15 years, and the pastors ask you to do something, you say, oh pastor that's not my gifting, it's got nothing to do with your gifting, it's got to do with your commitment to Jesus Christ. Amen. Paul says, I pummel my body into submission. Learn to speak on your feet. Principle number seven, learn to handle your emotion. I didn't say emotion is wrong. Voltaire says emotion is the enemy of reason. But you know, when Christians go into business, if they haven't been into business before, and something goes wrong, you know what happens? If the wheels fall off, they become an emotional basket case. They say things that hang around like a 40-year mortgage. I mean, some of the things they say, they blame people and uh, all sorts of things go on. You've got to be able to handle your emotion. There's nothing wrong with emotion, but it's got to be in the right context. Now, we have proven scientifically that emotion is not always subject to reason, 
but it's always subject to action, and action is the key word. So if you get emotional, go for a run around the block, punch a punching bag, uh, stack up the dishes, get the vacuum cleaner out, get the lawnmower out, get involved in some physical action, put your hand over your mouth, and you do it for a couple of hours, and your emotion will be under control. Principle number eight, learn to handle criticism. Now, if you're going to make a mark for good and for God, you are going to be criticized. Back in 1973, I came home from church on Sunday morning, took the newspaper off the step. Rabina was, went into the kitchen to turn on the, you've never had anything like this, roast lamb with mint sauce. I mean, the lamb that you've got here is nothing like the lamb we've got in Australia. I mean, you would... Uh, <laughs> and she'd bring a cup of tea into the lounge room and we, we'd sit and talk. But she was making the cup of tea and I opened the newspaper and suddenly she heard these words. They can't do this. She said, do what? I said, they're bringing pornography into our nation. It's always against our wives, our sisters, our mothers, our daughters, our nieces. It's always against womanhood. I said, something's got to be done about it. She said, that's interesting. What are you going to do? Well, to cut a long story short, I took to the Supreme Court with some other people and the first time for 200 years in the British Empire, I stopped them from using women as pornographic objects. And I was laughed at. They had the headlines, Mr. Denials instead of Mr. Daniels. They had these cartoons of me. Every comic in the country, every hippie, drippy, libertine, uh, all had these stories about me. They, they made up all sorts of stories. Every radio program was uh, on. And, and I remember one time I was going down to close and I did 213 debates on radio and television on one subject, good morals as good economics. And uh, they'd expect me to, you know, milk toast Christian and, and so on, and they'd quote all the, all the philosophy and so on, and I'd correct their quotes and rip their guts out. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and uh, I was going, one day I was going in closing down some uh, porno shops, and the, news, the uh, news media lay down on the ground. They took this long shot of me to play at six o'clock news and there it came on at six o'clock news and they made me look nine feet tall and they played it in slow motion they had Frankie Lane in the background singing High Noon and uh, <laughs> and, and uh, I had that police protection gangsters were after me it was just an incredible time in my life and uh, so my, my Christian friends came to me and they said Peter we want to protect you I said what are you talking about they said all this criticism oh yeah they said, we want to protect you from all this criticism. Uh, how, how are you sleeping? I said, I'm sleeping like a baby. They said, but all this criticism that's coming your way, all the airways, all the, all the newspapers, the magazines, the, uh, the uh, university magazines, all, everything that's happening around you, they throw things at you, they spit on you, they do all sorts of things. We're going to put a wall around you and protect you from all this criticism. I said, oh, fellas, back off, back off. They said, why? I said, because I'm sleeping like a baby. I said, criticism has no power. The only power that criticism has is that which you give it while you're tossing and turning, trying to work out what that person said or what you thought they meant by what they said. You are giving criticism a power drive to destroy your life. Criticism has no authority unless you give it to it. I like what Mark Twain says about criticism. He said, if there's any real power in criticism, the skunk would have been extinct years ago. <laughs> Number nine, the law of attraction. I wonder what would happen if I had to come here and when Pastor introduced me, I ran out from this door and I had not had a bath for four years. I had not had a shave or a haircut and I had half of yesterday's breakfast on my beard and I had a pair of old jeans on with the sandals and dirty toenails sticking through and I had some worry beads and I was going to swing these and talk to you about success. How would you people who look upon the heart have received me? <laughs> You'd have cancelled me out. Why? Because you don't get a second chance on a first impression. Clothes may not make the man, but boy, they sure do introduce him. You know, we've got some 
some Christians that say, well, they can take me or leave me. I'll leave you. <laughs> We've got some Christians that say, it doesn't matter how you come into the house of God. Well, you're reading a different Bible than I am. Read about Aaron and said, give him fine robes to give him dignity and honor. And we need to use the law of attraction. In a business, we say birds of a feather flock together, if you want the scientific meaning of that. Ornithological species of identical plumage tend to congregate in the closest proximity. But you make sure that all your material and all your samples and all your point of sale material and your office and everything is spit and polished. Make sure that your voice, listen to your own voice occasionally, is it warm. I'm going to say something else. I'm not going to look at my wife because she'll go like that to me so I'll talk to you. All right? <laughs> Psychologists tell us that people with dirty interiors of motor cars Wear dirty underwear. <laughs> Paul, would you go out tomorrow night with a torch and we'll put some numbers up here uh, or something? <laughs> the law of attraction. Do you attract or repel? Be nice to people on the way up. You meet the same people on the way down. Number 10, persistence. My Bible says, having put your hand to the plough and looking back, you're not fit for the kingdom of heaven. Well, I was too honest to be in business. Oh, give me a break. What about Abraham? Was he dishonest? What about Joseph of Arimathea? I mean, we could go right through. Uh, all the disciples were in business. I've got a friend I'll just use his first name. His name was George. He always got around in combination overalls. Grey combination overalls. He was a mechanic. And he loved aeroplanes. But uh, he'd never owned one. I mean, if he got an opportunity to be co-pilot for a flight somewhere, the garage was shut. Doesn't matter how urgent your car was, he was gone. He loved motor cars. He couldn't put hardly anything in the collection every week. He just existed. But you know, one day he was on this plane and the thing gave a cough and it spluttered and it started to lose altitude, smoke started pouring out of the fuselage, he was co-pilot and they crashed on top of a mountain hooked up in a huge tree. He was still alive but badly battered and so was his uh, pilot friend. They could smell that, that, that aviation fuel, they knew any minute that thing was going to blow up. They jumped out of the aeroplane onto the ground. He broke both his legs. He pulled himself away by pulling on the twigs and so on. He lay on his back and suddenly the plane exploded and blew and burned his clothes off. I said, George, is that the, when the change took place in your life, when you were on the top of the mountain, when that explosion took place? He said, yes. He said, that's where it happened. He said, I looked up to heaven. I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? He said, I didn't have to know the Greek of this or the Hebrew of that could work well in English. He said, when I went to hospital, I was there for three months. I had some, as an insurance policy due to me. He said, and I started to think, and I said, Lord, if you get me out of this, I'm going to be a different George. I'm going to do something quite, quite different. He was in his mid, mid to late 40s at the time, never done anything. And he decided that there was some land that he could, he, he started to do a feasibility study on it in this land, and he, but he had to borrow $3 million. And when he came out of hospital, still partly in bandages, he went to a, a bank and tried to borrow uh, $3 million. They almost laughed at him. And so he went to the next bank. And then he went to the next bank. And then he went to the next bank. And then he went to the next bank. George went to 97 banks. And they all said, no, what do you do? You have a go. And if it doesn't work, well, God, just close the door. Oh, come on, give me a break. He got it at the 98 bank. Georgia worth 600 million today. One of God's generals in giving around the world. What about you? You're going to have a little shot at something. If you fall down, you say, well, that's the end of that. We can't do it. No, get up and go again. You fall down, get up and go again. You fall down, get up and go again. Benjamin Disraeli said perseverance and tact are the two great qualities most valuable for all mankind who want to amount to something, but especially for those who want to step out of a crowd. Principle number 11, 
worry, handling pressure. Boy, you better be able to handle pressure. Does the name Dr. Norman Vincent Peale mean anything here? I worked with Norman for 22 years, one of the kindest people I ever knew. He tells a wonderful story. He, he was walking down the street in New York one day and someone bumped into him and the man looked up, he said, oh my goodness, you're, you're, you're Dr. Norman Vincent Peale. He said, correct. You wrote the book, The Power of Positive Thinking. He said, that's right. So 27 million copies, he said, correct. Oh, he said, this is my lucky day. He said, well, how can I help you? I'm a minister of the gospel. He said, it's all these problems I've got, Dr. Peel, all these worries, these worries, all these worries, all these troubles. He said, if you can help me with them, you'll be my friend for life. And Dr. Peel said to him, well, do you want me to get rid of some of them or all of them? Oh, he said, all of them. He said, well, he said, as a minister of the gospel, he said, I've, I, I've just left 150,000 people who have no problems at all. He said, well, take me to them. He said, the Westgate Cemetery. <laughs> and he went on to say the problems are a sign of life. And the more problems you've got, the more life you've got. And if you haven't got any problems, when you get home, get down alongside your bed and put your hand up to heaven and say, Lord, don't you trust me anymore. Give me some problems. <laughs> Let me tell you, the people here that have had to overcome problems, they're the ones that are smart. They're the ones that are smart, not these that run away from the problems. I was talking earlier with Pastor about a man called W. Clement Stone. At one time had 14 secretaries. And he was in his office and he heard one of his secretaries say, Oh, that's a problem. And with his squeaky voice he called out, Shut the doors, shut the windows, don't let it go. If it's a problem, bring it to me. I'll handle all the problems, it'll make me strong. He made a billion dollars when a billion dollars was a lot of money. What is worry? It's anti-Bible. It's creating mental pictures of the things you do not want. We have to be able to handle our problems. Number 12, decision making. This is where we fall down more than in any other area in life. I've seen more marriages collapse, I've seen more businesses fail, I've seen more wars last. I've seen more relationships split, I've seen more churches fall apart, not because of bad decisions, but because they won't make decisions. When I saw Rwanda on television, I said to my wife, if I can get 500 mercenaries and a dozen gunships, we'll go in there and we'll shoot that place up and we'll clean it up in about a week, because the United Nations are not going to do a thing. And whatever you think of President Bush, when he said they're just a, an ineffective debating society, I agree with him. But uh, my goodness me, we lost a million people. A million people. Because no one would make a decision. And we as Christians are the worst. Look, when you, when, you, when you give a call for salvation, you ask people to get up out of their seat, give their life to Christ, and a twinkle like that. If they do, you know what we do? We all clap. You know what the angels do in heaven? Whoopee! They cheer. In a split second. But the pastor asks you to give some money towards something. You say, well, I've got to speak to my wife. I have to speak to my accountant. I need to talk to my bank manager. I mean, you've put the evaluation on what's more important. There's something wrong with this. You know, I have Christians, as soon as they have to make a decision, uh, they've got to pray about it for a week. I've seen them on the highway. A Mack truck's coming down. They don't get on their knees and say, Lord, should I stay or move? <laughs> I mean, what's happening to us? Sometimes I'm in charge of big Christian organizations and we do our demographics and we're going to do some great work somewhere around the world. We raise the money, we send out the prayer chain letters, we do everything that we're supposed to do, but sooner or later you've got to make a decision. When are you going to pull the switches? When are you going to put everything ahead? And we call everyone together and if I'm chairman of the board, we'll meet somewhere in the world, in Singapore or Chicago or London or wherever, and we meet together and finally as chairman of the board. We pray, we discuss it, then I call for a vote. And some twit on the board, some knothead, says, Mr. Chairman, I've got a feeling in my spirit over this. I tell him to go to the bathroom. I mean, some knothead holds up all the work of God because they've got a feeling they've added nothing to the conversation. They've, uh, I've got to check in my spirit about this. Well, for goodness sake, check it out. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can change something, you can correct something, you can't correct nothing. 
we allow the dissenters to be the deciders. My Bible says the double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways who can know him. We have proven scientifically that successful people make decisions quickly and change them rarely, and unsuccessful people make decisions slowly and change them often. Am I ringing any bells out here? Well, let's start to wind down. Because I mustn't keep you too late tonight, you won't sleep. I, one of the corporations I own is called the World Center of Entrepreneurial Studies. It's quite different than the university. We don't have a campus. I was in New York and one taxi driver had four earned degrees in business and he couldn't run a business. Universities are great for medicine and engineering and other disciplines, but in business they're absolutely hopeless. Because by the way, by the time they collate the information and put it into book form and then they teach the professors and the professors teach the students and the students a couple of years later do the exam, it's useless. Moving too fast, it's useless. So we, we, we don't have a campus. We go anywhere in the world, we're invited and the time frame that they have available and we teach them what they want to know or we'll do for them what they need to be done and we don't even charge very often. We say, well, uh, give us a percentage of the extra you make. Uh, that's real confidence in what you're doing. Now, um, uh, would you like me to show you some of the material that I brought from Australia? Are you interested? Yes. Don't overwhelm me with your enthusiasm, will you? Do you want to know or don't you? Yes. Okay. Uh, Paul, would you go out with my wife and I'll just wind this a little bit up here. You know, the greatest power gift that you have is here tonight. The greatest power gift that God has ever given to man is right here in this church tonight. It was there in the beginning with Adam. It's here tonight right with you. It's called the power of choice. You can decide tonight not to come back tomorrow night. You'd be foolish if you made that decision because tomorrow night's going to be very different. If you've got any friends, you should bring them. If you've got any enemies, boy, you should bring them. Tell them you'll pay their fare. One church charged $1,000 for each member of the church to come to a meeting that I spoke at on one day. 600 members of a church that's only got 800 people in it paid the $1,000 and they paid their building off in one day. They would like me to come back again. They're prepared to pay it. <laughs> well, the people have asked to come back. So the power of choice. You can make a decision. You can draw a line in the sand and say, our family is not going to go over that line. We're going to build a heritage for our family for seven generations. I tell you what, it'll get your attention. And you need to be heroes to your children and your grandchildren. Some of you are wondering why uh, you're not getting anywhere with your kids. Well, if you're a big enough example, if you're a hero, then they follow you. All of our grandchildren have a huge plaque above their bed and it's got our family crest on it, which is Strength in the Lord, Ephesians 6. Underneath that, it'll have their name, Jacob, Reese, Daniels. And it'll have family creed. It says, O oh Lord, you've provided my portion of my cup. The boundary lines for me have fallen into pleasant places. Yes, I have a delightful inheritance. Underneath that, it has a cross and uh, in the center of the cross it's got a shield and each corner of the cross is a word one is faith one is truth one is kindness and one is discipline so if Jacob ever has a problem at school that's big enough he has to see his grandfather he will come in with his bottom lip trembling just a little bit he'll get dressed up to come and see his grandfather and I will say to Jacob, you've had a problem at school, Jacob. Tell me about it. Poppy, it wasn't fair. Well, tell me about it. Did you exercise faith? Yes, Poppy, I did. Did you tell the truth? Yes, Poppy, I did. Did you act in discipline? Yes, I did, Poppy. Were you kind? Well, I tried to be. Jacob, you weren't kind. You have to go back to that girl that you kicked. 
and you have to go to your own money and buy an expensive gift and apologize to her in front of other people and give her that gift. They cannot break the family creed. It's not possible, it's not allowable. And they can rattle it off, even little 10 years old can rattle it off very quickly. That's how we train our family. I brought some things along here to show you tonight, but let me just say this. I trust that you'll come tomorrow night. It's going to be very, 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 very different. It's going to be like grand final day at football. I was in Norway, and I don't know whether you've ever been to Norway, but when you speak at a church in Norway, they sit there with their arms folded and look straight ahead. There is absolute no, no emotion. There's not a flicker in the eye. They were almost standing on their seats when we did this. So tomorrow night is going to be extremely different. The first book I wrote, and by the way, do not spend money you cannot afford. Learn the pain of going without. That's discipline number one. The first book I wrote was How to Be Happy Though Rich. It's not about getting, it's about giving. And uh, when I did this, the Australian government, who have a special television channel with no advertisements, did a full prime time television special on my life and, uh, and this book. Within this, I've shown some of the formulas that I produce. People pay millions of dollars for these formulas. One formula, you just ask yourself four questions. Now, I elaborated on here. But you pull your life together with just four simple questions. Question number one, what age have you set yourself to reach your full potential that God might maximize your life? Question number two, could you tell me in 50 pages or more what your full potential is in every area of your life? Question number three, accepting your full potential is 100%, what percentage rating would you give yourself right now? Question number four, accepting the deficiency between the two scores, what plans are you going to make to take up the shortfall and when? That'll pull your life together in a hurry. Also, I show you how I measure every day on a mathematical equation. Because if I ask you what sort of a day you had, you'll tell me you had a good day, a fair day, or great day. That's like the state of your digestion. <laughs> the reason I don't work hard, the reason I don't work long, I know what I want to do, I'm specific, and I measure every day on a mathematical equation. The second book I wrote, and, and, and that happened because I never went to normal schooling. They say uh, uh, you think differently because you have never been through formal schooling. The second book I wrote was How to Reach Your Life Goals. Um, this one would qualify every year on the, uh, the bestseller list here in America, but I don't sell through bookshops, so we don't qualify in that uh, way. But when I wrote it, we, uh, we certainly didn't let anyone know anything about it. I just wrote the book and, and uh, contacted all the people that normally buy my books. and. Uh, but the newspapers got out of it, and it was on the front page of the Brisbane Courier. That's one of the biggest newspapers in the whole of Australia. It took up one third of the whole front page. They said this is the first time in the history of literature that the medical profession have asked for a book to go on cassette tape to reprogram damaged brains. Uh, so it's, it's, a little bit, it's a little bit different, but it's just a formula that I use. Uh, this one goes with it, how to be motivated all the time. That's a formula of how to be motivated. It's not yelling and jumping up and down, but don't read it going to bed. You'll never get to sleep. <laughs> when I wrote that book, someone said to Rabina, have you, have you read Peter's last book? She said, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this one is how to handle a major crisis. It's our worst seller, but it saved more lives than any other single thing. It, I, I, I'm going to write a book about this book, and I'm going to call it Those Who Were Rescued. The number of people that were saved from suicide, from divorce, from bankruptcy, from all manner of, of distress is uh, almost legendary, but it's not our bestseller. This one here is uh, how to have the awesome power of public speaking. I was once the highest paid speaker in the entire world, but it's not what I do. It's, uh, uh, actually, I went to a public speaking class uh, when I'd gone through all the, uh, all the dictionaries 
And when and I paid the fee, but when I heard the guy introduce himself, I thought, I don't want to be as bad as that, and I ran out and I didn't even go back. <clears throat> I remember on Sunday, if you were here, I spoke about Miss Phillips, my teacher, that punched me, kicked me, slapped me, used to get me by the chin, wrap my teeth, and say, Peter Daniels, you're a bad, bad boy, and you're never going to amount to anything. This is called Miss Phillips, you were wrong. This, this is a formula to handle rejection. I, I've had a lot of rejection. I used to have ears that stuck out like taxi cab doors. They called me saddle flaps at school. That was all right if you're riding a bike and the wind was behind you. That was, that was a help. But I got pinned back with plastic surgery and now I look like I'm riding a bike against the wind. Uh, but people, people ask me, uh, uh, by the way, that was done for salespeople. But you know the biggest readers? Kids from 11 years upwards. They love it. They say, that's a cool book, puppy. But uh, uh, people ask me, you know, uh, did Miss Phillips ever find out? No, she died many years ago. And when she died, they buried her 60 feet in the ground. Because <laughs> uh, deep down, she was a real nice person. <laughs> <laughs> Now, come on, get your act together. Come on. <laughs> if you keep laughing like that, I'll tell you a joke. <laughs> and then my wife will come in. And she says, you can go 24 hours without telling the same joke twice. Uh, <laughs> this is my biography called Living on the Edge. If you're not living on the edge, you're taking up too much room. And uh, this will uh, show you my... Uh, my wife, when she was uh, 16, oh my goodness, what a doll. What a doll. I was gobsmacked when I first saw her. I mean, after I had my first kiss, I didn't wash my face for two weeks. <laughs> and she married this grubby bricklayer. I tell her now, she, she understood potential. That, uh, but uh, that tells you how I did at warts and all. Uh, uh, it was a horrible part of my life, some of it. Uh, and by the way, most of this stuff now is all sold. You have to pay for it and we will fly it in and I'll pay the freight because to get a book from Australia will cost you probably as much, if not twice as much, as the cost of the book. So if you pay for it, we'll have it flown in here and you'll be able to pick it up from here. Now this is a limited edition and please again, don't spend money you can't afford. This is. Uh, a, a, a book that's uh, numbered, it's my biography with our family crest on it, it's numbered, it's signed, it's dated. We have three DVDs that show many of the interviews and debates I've had over the years, uh, right from the beginning right up to 70 years of age. So you'll see I had a little bit more hair and, and, and so on, and uh, a little bit more outrageous than what I am now, if that's possible. And, uh, and there's a, a CD of some uh, uh, radio programs that I did. About eight years ago, I became very ill. I had, um, I got this aneurysm in my brain. It's uh, bigger than a golf ball. And I was staggering around the place and it looked like that if there's the slightest problem with it, I'm, I'm curtains, I'm finished. And uh, I was, uh, I wasn't very well at all. And Rabina came to me and she said, Peter, God may take you home. I said, well, he's in charge. If he wants to give me an early minute, that's all right. I've never argued with God's will, and I won't do it now, but I think there's more to be done. She said, well, if God calls you home, all the formulas you've created, how to handle your economics, how to negotiate a deal, how to handle banks, how to have supreme confidence for every occasion, how to develop an idea, how to use your imagination in a new field of behavioral science that you created, uh, how to uh, 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 do, uh, evaluate your strengths and weaknesses, and, uh, and just all of these multitude of formulas you've done. She said, I want you to put them in sequence. I want you to put it in such a way that once our grandchildren reach 18, that they will understand it very easily because I don't believe anyone in the world has done the research that you've done and then put it into practice and been successful with it. Will you do that and try and get it done before God takes you home? I said, sweetie, I'm running out of gas. 
I don't think I'll be able to do it. Well, I did finish it and then I got well. I would never have tackled it otherwise. And then we did a program called Destiny of the Third Millennium and put it in a program. We launched it here in the United States. And we did about 17,000 of them. And I checked up today, we have 194 left in the entire world. And this is the program here. It's called Destiny of the Third Millennium. It is the most comprehensive success program in the entire world. Uh, we're in London and 400 of these went in one church in 25 minutes. Uh, if you get this, you don't need any of the other books except maybe the biography. And everything I've learned in my lifetime is in there. And if you ever have a business problem you cannot handle, then you... If you've got this, you contact us, we put our research team on it, and within 72 hours, we get back to you with an answer to that problem. We've never been stumped yet, but I guess sooner or later we're going to be. But, uh, uh, so uh, if you're interested, but again, uh, we've got a limited number. There will not be any left after I finish this trip by the end of the month. Uh, if you're interested in that, that may, uh, may be uh, good for you. Pick this up. So, now what I'm going to do is just open it very quickly for questions. And by the way, all of these have to be flown in. If you have a question, go to a microphone and uh, we'll handle it very quickly for you to stimulate your questions. Maybe I'll just uh, say one thing. Would you, would you like me to show you how I negotiate a deal? Yes. Okay. Um, let me suggest one. One that I did the best price I could get worldwide for a product was $25 each. I needed one million of them. That meant $25 million. Every dollar I could save on it, I was saving $1 million. Now there's a pastor here in this city, or in Dallas, called Dr. Walkson, asked me one day, point blank, he said, Peter, how do you make money? I've never been confronted with it quite like that. I said, you make money by negotiation. Now, the best I could get for this was $25 worldwide. My wife said, sweetheart, you're going to have to accept it. I said, I'm not going to accept it. She said, well, that's the best you can get. I said, I, I, I'm still looking. She said, well, what price do you expect to get? I said, about eight bucks. She said, you're never going to get that. I said, sweetheart, write that on the wall of the kitchen because it might be something you have to eat later. <laughs> I got it for $7.86. Let me give you another instance. Uh, we had to have a job done on our country property, which is a beautiful estate. The best price I could get was $100,000 by someone who was in the area and I knew they would do a good job. I waited two days, I phoned them up. I said, uh, Charlie, I got your quote. He said, did I get the job? I said, do you want the job? He said, well, of course I do. I said, well, how would you feel, Charlie, if in two weeks time I Chopped around and I got it for 90000 Long silence. He said, I wouldn't feel too good at all. He said, you mean to say if I do it for 90000 I've got it? I said, yes, you've got my word on it. You can come to my office tomorrow morning, 10 o'clock, it'll be made out for you, signed, you'll be paid within 30 days of completion. He said, I'll be there at 10 o'clock sharp. He came at 10 o'clock sharp, we gave him cookies and and coffee and so on and I had the contract made out on the desk already signed all he had to do was countersign it and it was his irrevocable but I had eighty thousand dollars covering the rest of the desk in small denominational bills <laughs> screwed up a little bit he's drinking his coffee and he's looking at that eighty grand sitting there he said what in the world is all that money doing for I said well on the other side that's your contract you can grab it and go as soon as you like. He said, well, what's all that money doing there? I said, that's for some, some lucky guy today. He said, I could be so lucky. He said, how much there? I said, 80,000. Wow. I said, well, you can have it if you want it. There's a plastic bag there. You can put it in and take it home with you if you want to do it for 80,000. I said, but the other contract's there. You can sign it and you, can, you got that too. What do you think he did? He took the 80000 because he didn't have to go to a bank and he could negotiate with cash now. And he got the money before he even started. 
That's how you negotiate. Now, there's 21 principles of a negotiation. One, what am I trading? Two, what am I forfeiting? Three, what are the uncertainties? Four, what are the guarantees or penalties? Five, what is the term? Six, what could cause failure? Seven, can I fully perform? Eight, can they fully perform? Nine, what are the buffer zones? Ten, what if we underestimate? Eleven, what if we overestimate? Twelve, can cost expand? Thirteen, can percentages decrease? Fourteen, are there any exit points? Fifteen, are there any conditions of mutual withdrawal? Sixteen, are there any outside influences? Seventeen, who exactly is in charge? Eighteen, what are the ongoing obligations? Nineteen, are there any upper or lower limits? Twenty, are the personality involved permanently committed? Twenty-one, are all points of concern agreed, written, dated, signed and witnessed? Now, I know you wrote all those down. Now, why did I do it like that? I did it so that you'll get the CD. Because if some of you are so lousy you won't get it, you'll try and remember it. Well, you're not going to go into business like that. Get the CDs. Play them seven or eight, ten, fifteen, twenty times. Now, has anyone got, uh, got a question? Come straight to the microphone because we'll close it if you're not going to do it. If there's nobody that wants to earn any money, we'll, we'll just close it. Oh, they're coming. Yes, give me your name and the question. Straight off. Okay, come on. Come on. What's the question? My name is Deborah Overton. You mentioned, I guess it was yesterday, about your three failed business attempts. Yes. How did you end up getting out of debt and while you were doing all that, um, that each time that you were in business then you got into debt and how did you end up recuperating from everything? How did, uh, the question is, I was in business three times, I failed three times, how did I get out of debt and start again. I was in business the next day. Why? Because I'm a good commission salesman. And there are plenty of things around that people want to sell, but they haven't got the courage or the ability to sell it. So I had to put bread on the table. So the next day I was in business selling something and making money before nightfall. And it wasn't long before I was selling other stuff and people knew that I was free and they used me and I was able to pay that debt back. So that's how I did it. Okay? Right. Yes, what's your... Hi, my name is Dara, and listening to your story of coming out of, like you said, you had to reach up to touch poverty, and hearing, I mean, I think we've all had our faith journeys. My question to you is, what was your biggest challenge to overcome to get from below broke to where you are now? What was your, like your transitional, what just kind of... Yeah, my brain. Okay. My brain. See, I, it's just a muscle. That's all it is. See, I've read, uh, until recently, 6,700 biographies alone. That builds a vocabulary of overcoming incredible odds. You see, I study economics, history, law, uh, theology. I mean, I'm studying all the time. And uh, I, I can usually read eight books at a time. And maybe if we get the chance, I'll show you how I do that. All right? Yes, sir. Uh, my grandpa always said, if you never ask, you never get. And uh, I wanted to ask if I could be one of the guys on the platform tomorrow. And if that's not okay, I'll even be one of the women on the platform. <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, there's no cross-dressing in this church. <laughs> uh, you'll just have to stand up with the rest of them. I'm sorry. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, my name is Raul. My question is, um, I know that you are a, under a no-debt theory. Yeah. At any point in time, do you ever choose, do you think there's a possibility to use other people's money? That what? To use other people's money. To, Not to for make the last money. 30 years. Under no circumstances, no. you don't believe so? No, we don't need it. We've got plenty of our own. <laughs> yes. My name is Janie, and uh, God gave me a vision in 2003 to start a Christian newspaper. Yes. And, uh, What's your problem then? Well, it's on the making right now. I'm a widow, I'm a woman, and no money. And God said, put your hand to the plow and start it January the 1st, 2006. Have you had any experience running a newspaper? Yes. Okay, so how much money do you need? See, so you haven't even thought of that. You've got to put your head together. A million. Hey? About a million. No, you're just throwing that figure out. Okay. You don't know exactly how much you want. And that's what you we're working on. You don't know whether you're going. No, but you, you won't need a million because you'll get someone else to do the printing no. for you. You'll have to. Well, you, you're crazy if you don't get someone else to do the printing. Well, I am doing you the. You can't work the press 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Okay. So you, you see, the first thing you should do is go out and get a job selling on commission. That's what I'm doing. Are you making any money on it? Yes. Hundred, two hundred thousand a year? No. 
Well, you've got to get yourself right on that because okay. commission is set for mediocrity and any fool can beat mediocrity. Okay. You've got to get better at what you're doing. You. Yes. Hi, my name is Sherry. My question is after reading your autobiography, the thing I saw in it is every time you started a business, it just seemed like it wasn't something you chose. You did it to make commission to make money, and then you started yeah. a business from it. If somebody was choosing what they were going to start a business as, would you encourage them that it was something that they enjoy doing or just go out whatever you're good at and start doing it and then start a business with it? You've got to work out whether or not the business is going to make money. That's what you're going to business for. You can play with other things after. If you've made enough money, you can do what I do. You can ride horses. You can take your children to the beach. Your grandchildren out, you can take them to Disneyland for Christmas and all that sort of thing. But you've got to look at where you can make money. And I'd give you the same advice I give that lady there. Go out and get a job selling on commission only for two years. It'll transform your brain. You're good at selling almost anything that you go to sell. You won't know whether you're good at something until you have to go out and sell it on commission. Right, but if you have and you're really good at doing yes. it. And you want to start a business. Yes. But well, what's your problem then? How do you know what it is you need to... S you just make a decision. Just make a decision. That's all. Okay. Just make a decision. That's good. Okay. No one's asked me a hard question yet. I, I mean, this is kid stuff. Come on. Mr. Daniels, my name is Sophia Bassett, and I have a patent on a medical device that I have been working very diligently to try and get into the okay, right... Okay, question. Have you actually created a model of it that works? Yes. Okay, well the next thing you should do is register design and patent it. I have, it has been You have patent it. Okay, now patent. this is what you need to do, okay? What you need to do is to go to the medical profession and sell it to them at an amount of money or on a percentage basis for the rest of your life. But make sure you got it tied up tight and make sure it works and get them to the sign a no-disclosure form when you show it to them. Okay, okay, and what if I've done that? You've done that? Yes, have, sir. Have you done any good? No, sir. You haven't? Well, why not market it yourself? Capital. Oh, <laughs> capital is not a problem. How much money do you need to market it? $400,000. How much? $400,000. $400,000. Well, would you like to have $400,000 without having to pay any interest and never have to pay it back? Absolutely. Okay, well, this is what you do. You find 10 people that have got $40,000. You choose people that have got brains, not people that have just been left money. Okay, and you form a limited liability company and you sell out 40% of the company to them. You've got to do a business plan. I'll show you how to do that later. Uh, do a business plan and show what blue sky there is and what opportunities there are. And you sell out 40% of the corporation for $400,000. Now, you pick people that are smart. Then you get those... Uh, 10 people and you put them on your board of directors. Now what have you got? You've got the $400,000 and you've got a board of directors and they're going to push, 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 push you to make sure it gets done. They're going to get on the phone and call people they know and say you better get on to this because this works and so on and so forth. Now what have you got? You've got $400,000, you've got a board of directors that are pushing you like crazy and when it starts to make a lot of money you sell out another 9% to them for a million dollars because it's worth a lot more now than what it was then. So now you've made $1,400,000, you still have 51% control, so you're totally in control. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> yes. Brother Daniels, I'm Monique Spaulding, and I heard that you were in real estate before. Mm. And I have a real estate question. Texas is a large real estate area. Uh, four plexes sell very well for What's investors. Question? question is, over a long period of time, does the residual income and cash flow equations that they use for real estate really work in financial? Yes, it does, providing we have inflation continually. But what if we have deflation? Okay. See, I got out of real estate because it was so boring, it was so easy to make money. <laughs> I mean, it just was so boring. There's no challenge there. Uh, the answer is yes, provided we have inflation. But if we have deflation, then you're going to have a uh, uh, problem. If we have implosion, which we could have within the next 15 years, you're going to pay uh, $500,000 for a property and all you're going to get back for it is 80000 Thank you, sir. Okay, yes. What's your question? My name is Tom. Uh, I was in private practice of law, then I went into private banking. You were in law? I was in law. I was okay. in law. Let's see, see if banking. I still remember. 
the law of contract, offer and acceptance, form and consideration, contractual capacity of the party, legality of consent, and reality of object. Am I Very right? Very good. Very good. Good. One thing I learned being an attorney is there's so many hours in the day, so I figured out that I don't want to be in a position where it requires me in order to have the business. The second thing that I figured out by private banking, I asked one of my clients, how did you get to where you were? He told me the same thing that you told us yesterday. The first four bankruptcies were really tough. So I think it's a matter of going after risk. Uh, with respect, you're doing it the wrong way. Okay? okay. You want good advice? Sure. Okay, well, you're, you're, you're a lawyer? I'm a lawyer, I'm an law? accountant, yes. Commercial law? Uh, I'm actually a tax attorney. Okay, you need to get really sharp on commercial law. Then there's at least 20 or 30 corporations here represented tonight, I bet. You offer to do all their law for them free of charge as long as they give you 5% of their annual turnover or annual profits. That way you've got 30 or 40 companies that you're getting 5% of their annual profits. What more do you want? I, I agree. I think that's fantastic. I have one more question though well, on the, along those lines. Finally three times. The que sorry. The question is, I've had a lot of people, members come to me and ask me questions. It seems that they all want to go into business, but they don't know what businesses they want to go well, into. Keep away from them. They're very flaky people. <laughs> what? <laughs> They're very flaky people. What advice would you give to them to find a go business? home? Leave me alone. <laughs> okay. Get your act together. <laughs> yes. How is it that kids can make money like? Be button. How can kids make money without like? How actually... can kids make money? Yeah. Well, do you want me, how old are you? Thirteen. Thirteen. Well, my 16-year-old uh, grandson is earning eight, $800 a day in his spare time. Uh, he, uh, but he goes surfing three days a week. Uh, and uh, he owns his own truck freehold. He's got uh, a lot of assets that he made all himself. Now, our 10-year-old granddaughter saw the tsunami problem. She was so shocked with it. She went and got her money and she went to a craft shop and bought a lot of stuff and then two weeks later her eldest brother was uh, uh, doing wakeboarding competition, he's very athletic and she went there with a thousand of people there and she took all her stuff in plastic bags and she walked around the whole thing and she sold the whole lot out and made so much money that she said, well now, there's so much money here, there's more than I anticipated, so I'll give half of it to the tsunami and I'll give half of it to the bushfires in Australia. And she was 10 years of age. If you think you can or you can't, you're right. Okay? Is that the end of the question? Boy, that was easy. No one wants to go into business and uh, make money uh, today uh, without any money down or anything like that. Oh, here's someone uh, who's got a question. This is the last question. You spoke about the possibility of keeping the world free as far as the market We're going down to South America. What would be the five most profitable businesses to go down there and build, so to speak? Well, selling is always the best business because uh, uh, somebody always wants something sold. The people that make the most money in any major corporation are the salespeople. Let me give you a little illustration of what happened in one corporation. There was a salesman that uh, was a bit different and a new sales manager came in and the sales manager told him to do things and he just ignored the sales manager and the sales manager chased after him he said I told you to do such and such he said I'll oh, go take a bath and walked out he went to the manager and said you know that salesman Smith told me just to take a bath when I told him to do something he said well we can't have that that's insubordination so he took it to one of the directors and they said uh, look, uh, I won't have people in this corporation talking to the managers like that. And so he mentioned the boardroom, and the chairman of the board said, well, let me have a look at his sales record. And he looked at his sales record and grabbed a towel. They said, where are you going? He said, I'm going for a bath. <laughs> Nothing happens until somebody sells something. So you get involved in the selling profession in the whole five areas, and you'll make a fortune. Okay? Thank you. Oh, one more. All right. I'm going to have to ask that question. How do you start a business without any money down? <laughs> Last question. Yes. Okay. Would you like to start a business tomorrow 
no money and have money in your pocket at the end of the week, well, this is what you do. You probably won't want to do it, but I've proven it so many times that it works, it's almost boring. Uh, <clears throat> you'll, uh, you get a pair of combination overalls. You go to one of these uh, areas where there's a lot of homes. You knock on the door. What's your name? John. John? Yes, sir. John? Yes, sir. Okay. You knock on the door. You say, take two steps back. You say, my name is John. Uh, we're just starting a window cleaning business in this area. And I would like to clean your windows free of charge. No, there's no catch to it. No, I don't want anything. There's no gimmick. You don't have to sign anything. I'll watch after the roses. I'll clean all the window sills down and I'll do it free of charge for you. We're new in this area coming in to do window cleaning. I just want to show you what a great job we do. You clean the windows by, and you show her after you say, what's your name? Mrs. Brown. Mrs. Brown, thank you so much. By the way, what's the name of the lady next door? Mrs. Black. You go next door, you knock on the door, you take two steps back, you say, Mrs. Black, my name is John. We are doing window cleaning in this area called John's Window Cleaning Service. We're new in this area. I would like to clean your windows free of charge, no cost at all. No, I've already done Mrs. Brown. She's very happy and nothing to sign. I'll look after the, all the plants. I, uh, I don't need to come inside. I'll clean your window. You clean it. She's happy. You say, by the way, the other side of Mrs. Brown, what's her name? Mrs. White. So you go and you knock on the door, you take two steps back, you've got your nice white overalls on. You say, Mrs. White, my name's John. I'm from John's Window Cleaning Service. We're just opening in this area. And just to show you what sort of a job we do, I want to do yours free of charge. I've already done it for Mrs. Black and Mrs. Brown. They're very happy, and I'll look after all the plants here. I'll shift the pots just here. I'll clean all the sills down for you, and I'll do a great job. No, I don't want a cup of tea or a cup of coffee. I'm, I just want to show you what we do. You bring her out, and she likes it. What have you done? You've invoked Luke 6.38. Given it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together. As you've given out to others, so it'll be given unto you. Then you go to every house on the street and you knock on the door. You take two steps back. You say, my name is John. I'm John's window cleaning service. We're new in the area. I've already, I want to, uh, we've already done the houses for Mrs. Brown, Mrs. White, and... Uh, uh, and Mrs. Black, they're very happy with what we do. Would you like me to clean your windows for 40 bucks? Or 50 bucks, or whatever it is. I did this in Queensland. The next day, one of the teenagers went out and he came in with something like 150 bucks that night of what he'd earned that day. It's not hard to start a business, but you want to start at this level. You start at the bottom and you learn. And you can also do it with car detailing. I call a man in and sometimes I have to wait two weeks for him to come. He cleans my wife's car and my car for a hundred bucks a lot. I mean, he does a fabulous job. He's gone in two and a half hours. He does about five lots each day. That's five hundred bucks a day. His, his outgoings would be less than fifty bucks. Is that easy? Okay, I'm going to turn it back to pastor. I'm going outside. If you want anything, please be respectful. Make a line or something. And if anyone wants this, uh, we, will, uh, we will make sure you get it. I will pay the freight and have it flown in for you because the freight is about $100 each just to, uh, just to take them in. And if Paul wouldn't mind taking this stuff back. And tomorrow night, you bring your seatbelts. May God expand your life until your destiny is fulfilled. God bless you.